Welcome, everyone. Um, we have a lot of material to cover today, so um, welcome to the 2021 Nonprofit Trend Webinar. Uh, would have really loved to do this in person, uh, but unfortunately, due to the, the fun times that we find ourselves in, um, we have to do this on a, a webinar basis. I do really miss the interaction with all of you. Um, you know, it's, it's great trying to do this in a way that uh, we can chat and stuff, but it's still, um, it, it kind of feels flat to me, and I, I kind of like the, uh, the whole interaction with the audience. But So let's get started. Um, like I said, we have a lot of material to cover today. So um, if we look at our uh, overarching trends that are happening within the, uh, the nonprofit sector here for 2021, obviously the coronavirus is going to continue to take um, center stage in terms of uh, what's going on. Uh, most doctors are predicting that the uh, pandemic will continue uh, well past the midpoint of the year. So do expect that this is going to be a uh, key thing that we will be grappling with throughout uh, 2021 or a big chunk of 2021. Uh, that means we're gonna continue to have an impact on our fundraising efforts, our work patterns, um, management time and resources and how management's gonna have to uh, interplay with the, the pandemic. All of these things are gonna uh, continue to be a challenge uh, into the beginning of the year. Um, you know, I mean, we've been talking about uh, a new normal and what that new normal is, is going to look like. And I think the reality of the situation is I think every organization has to kind of focus on what its new normal is, uh, given the fact that um, the world is never going to go back to where it was. And even if we do get a vaccine for the coronavirus and that vaccine, uh, everybody gets um, vaccinated uh, before the end of the year is out, there's still going to be some trepidation in terms of how operations go on uh, going forward. So I, I think we are going to continue to see a, uh, an impact of the coronavirus no matter what. Um, I think you're gonna see as part of that um, new normal for each organization, I think you're gonna see smaller uh, footprints in terms of space that organizations are using. I think a lot of organizations um, have seen that they can function effectively with smaller space. And I think you're gonna see organizations uh, cut back on the amount of space that they're using. Um, I think, uh, if nothing else, 2020 was a tremendous year in terms of technology and the nonprofit sector, who historically has been well, well behind the times from a technology perspective compared to the for-profit sector. I think the nonprofit organizations have um, made up some of that ground. There's been a tremendous level of use of technology and investment in technology by the nonprofit sector, and that's going to continue on into 2021. Um, telehealth and teleservices are things that uh, became big in 2020 as, you know, education went to remote learning and um, therapy went to remote therapy and there's been a lot more um, electronic means of delivery, delivering services. And I think that's going to be part of the new normal model going forward. And there's going to be some way that uh, telehealth is going to uh, telehealth and teleeducation, all those things are going to be here to stay in, in some aspects going forward. Um, again, it's going to take a while before people feel comfortable going back out into the, the world and uh, coming together again. So there's going to need to be some level of, um, you know, remote uh, things occurring, including um, virtual fundraising is going to continue for a while. Uh, we'll see, <clears throat> we've been seeing increased levels of isolationism and anxiety. Uh, and I think that uh, increased levels are going to continue in through 2021, uh, especially since we're seeing an uptick in the number of cases of the COVID pandemic. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, um, everybody I talk to knows somebody who uh, has it or has had it in the last week. So uh, uh, definitely a, a big, big uptick happening there. Um, you're going to see in the nonprofit organizations, you're going to see a change in organizational focus as nonprofit organizations, again, they, they look to find uh, different ways to uh, strategically run their business and strategically deliver services in more creative and innovative ways than they've had to in the past. Um, you're going to see uh, hybrid services and hybrid fundraising taking place where there's going to be aspects of both uh, in-person and remote happening. Uh, and I think you're going to see increased focus on uh, diversification and uh, leadership uh, within leadership and the boards. 
Um, and that's something that uh, we're definitely gonna be seeing a push in terms of that. Uh, organizations need to remain dynamic and flexible. Uh, every day brings with it uh, new adventures. Um, there seems to be changes in regulations. You know, today it's the vaccine. Who knows what tomorrow's issue is going to be? Um, but every time there's a new issue, there's new regulations that organizations have to stay on top of and, and make sure that they uh, understand what's happening with them. <clears throat> Government funding um, cuts are, are continuing. I mean, look at uh, New York State has a pretty sizable shortfall, and we'll talk about that um, in a little while. I don't think it's as steep as Governor Cuomo is claiming the shortfall is. I think there's been uh, some positives uh, that have helped close some of those shortfall gaps. But even so, there's been 20% cutbacks in the nonprofit sector. And uh, unless there are some additional federal aid, um, you know, which hopefully there will be to get some of that money back to the nonprofit sector, um, that's something we're going to have to continue to watch and is going to have an impact on the sector for 2021. Um, no more business as usual, unless usual means completely different. Um, <clears throat> things are, are going to, the one thing that we can say about, you know, life under COVID is it's, it's you know, ever changing, uh, ever difficult. Uh, and again, I, I don't think that there's uh, going to be anything uh, usual anymore. And I think uh, organizations are gonna, as I said earlier, be uh, creative and find out what their new normal is and what's gonna work for them. Uh, we're gonna see an increased level of collaboration. We're already seeing it. Uh, there's been talk for years now about, um, you know, uh, nonprofits increasing the number of um, partnerships and mergers that are taking place within the sector. And that hasn't necessarily been as rapid as everybody had thought over the last couple of years, but as um, government funding dries up, as organizations are finding it tougher and tougher to uh, raise money, um, you're just gonna see more and more um, of that uh, collaboration, back office function, mergers taking place. Um, and you know, now more than ever, you need to stay connected and informed. Um, you know, there's so much that's happening within the, the nonprofit sector. It's very, very important to get involved in different trade associations and following through with your trade associations to see what's happening with your unique funding sources, you know, or look for trade groups that are helping. There's a, a new organization out there, the Nonprofit Resource Hub, which is one of our partners uh, uh, for this presentation. And, you know, through the Nonprofit Resource Hub, if you go to their website, there's a, a ton of uh, information within the Nonprofit Resource Hub website that uh, you can um, gather and you can go through some of their seminars and stuff. But information is going to um, be exceedingly more important um, to be able to stay informed. We don't know what we don't know. And if we're not staying informed, we uh, are destined to have some problems. I was on a phone call today with one of my clients and he wasn't aware that uh, there are certain credits available for uh, payroll taxes for individuals who have had uh, the COVID pandemic and, and he's uh, paid several of his employees for um, work that they've performed, uh, but they not performed, but uh, paid their salary while they were out on uh, COVID and he didn't know he could get a credit for it. So there's a lot of information out there and you just got to know to write, uh, ask the right questions and stuff. Um, I think we have another um, question that we can kind of throw up on the screen. Um, after the pandemic, do you anticipate keeping a portion of your business remote? How many of you uh, I think are going to be doing some of it remote and how much of uh, you think you're going to go back to uh, kind of doing things more in, in person? 83% of you guys think you're gonna um, keep things remote and 17 are gonna look to go back in person. Uh, and I think that's gonna be the, the trend. I think uh, there's going to be remote aspects of um, everything we do on a go forward basis. And I think, um, again, it's gonna be important. All right, so let's look at uh, the state of the state. So as I said earlier, New York State has significant budget shortfalls. In October, when New York State issued its media report, uh, New York State said that there was going to be an $8.2 billion shortfall for 2021 and a $16.7 billion shortfall for fiscal 2022. Um, there has been some additional federal aid that came in the uh, December package, uh, which is the, the new CARES Act package that came out in December. There's been an increase in some of the state revenues. They went back and um, they've recalculated and they figure that they're going to do a little better than they had thought they were going to do. 
There's an additional 3.8 billion they're expecting for 2021 and 4.2 billion in 2022, um, which will help to uh, reuse some of that. Uh, the stock market has been doing very, very well, which hopefully will help to uh, close some of those shortfalls. Uh, we're also hoping that there will be uh, additional um, federal aid coming through the uh, new administration. Uh, how much of that will come to New York State is, is a question, but I know that uh, Governor Cuomo is expecting um, a large amount, so hopefully that will come and will help to uh, alleviate some of those 20% holdbacks that are uh, currently uh, happening. Uh, so far, uh, the state has uh, held back more than $3 billion from localities, school districts, nonprofits, state vendors, and state operation spendings, including uh, employee raises and stuff. So. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see some of that come back to the, the nonprofit sector. Also, the state is exploring legalized recreational marijuana and gambling to help close some of those budget gaps. Um, while that uh, could be beneficial in terms of dollars, uh, it just really opens up uh, more uh, concerns and social issues that um, will uh, the nonprofit sector is just going to have to grapple with on a go forward basis. Um, so again, 2021 is going to be an interesting year in terms of funding, something that we're going to have to keep watching and monitoring uh, in terms of the state budget. And hopefully, again, some of those shortfalls will find a way to be uh, eliminated. Um, while this is a, uh, a trend report in terms of where we think 2021 is going, there is some new stuff happening with respect to uh, the CARES Act and PPP. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I know we've done presentations on this in the past, but I do wanna talk about some of this stuff because again, the nonprofit sector is in dire need of funds. And this has opened up some uh, new avenues for funding for the nonprofit sector. So there's a round two of the PPP funds for those organizations that have seen a 25% drop in their revenue for at least one calendar quarter of 2020. So you're comparing the first quarter of 2020 to the first quarter of 2019, the second quarter of 2020 to the second quarter of 2019 on through the end of the year. And if you have at least one quarter where you've had a drop of 25% or more, you're eligible for the next round of PPP funding. Um, a lot of the banks have already opened up their, um, the ability for you to apply for it. So um, some of the bigger banks still haven't, but some of the smaller banks have definitely have the uh, application online already. Um, it's for organizations that have less than 300 employees. That 300 employees is an aggregate. So if you have multiple entities, you have to consider both the 25% drop and the 300 employees from an aggregated basis. You had to have used all of your prior funds. It doesn't mean you had to have asked for forgiveness yet. It just means you had to have uh, utilized the funds under the SBA guidelines. The new round is limited to $2 million. Uh, and they have expanded the um, use of the funds to include things like uh, accountants, payroll services, uh, some uh, software. So there are some additional uses of the funds and those additional uses are retroactive to the first um, PPP funds that came out last year. So something, uh, and also uh, PPE is also included in the PPP now. So those are things you should go back and, and look at. Um, unemployment insurance for those organizations that are self-insured. Um, the 50% federal subsidy has been extended through March 14th of 2020. Um, and for those of you who are uh, paying into the state system, remember that you're not required to pay in 100% of the amount that uh, of the unemployment, you're only required to pay in half. You can hold back the 50% that uh, the federal government is supposed to subsidize. Uh, otherwise, if you pay in the whole thing, you're going to have to wait for the money to come, and that may take some time. The Employee Paid Sick Leave Act, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier, where you have the uh, ability to um, get refunded up to 80 hours or get a credit for up to 80 hours cumulative of um, sick leave that you pay for an individual who was impacted due to COVID. Um, that has been extended through March 31st, 2021. Employers do not have to extend past December 31st. They can elect not to, but an employer can elect to extend through March 31st, 2021, uh, and they can continue to apply for the credit. But you have to remember that uh, the credit is accumulation or cumulative of 80 hours uh, entirely for each individual who works for you. <clears throat> Couple other things I wanna to touch on really quick. Um, HHS funding, um, 
so it says here, quick reminder that you need to file by February 15th, but as of yesterday, that changed. So you no longer um, have to file by February 15th. The application actually isn't even out yet. Uh, it was supposed to come out last Friday, but it never came out. The portal has been open, but the application's not available yet. So they're going to extend the due date of the uh, application for the forgiveness under the HHS funding. That's anybody who got uh, Medicaid or Medicare funding. Um, so that has been extended. Um, we don't know when the um, extension is gonna go through. Nothing has come out yet, so it's not yet available. And we are anticipating, I did have a phone call with HHS and we are anticipating a, a fourth round of um, funds to be made available um, of the eight from HHS funding. A um, couple other things, there's the employee retention tax credit. The employee retention tax credit um, has been around since uh, the first round of the, the CARES Act back in um, April of last year, but it really wasn't a big deal because um, if you got the PPP funding, you couldn't also get the employee retention tax credit and it wasn't as attractive a uh, vehicle as the PPP. Well, for um, now the uh, new regulations, they've come out and said you can get both the employee retention tax credit and the PPP. So um, you can actually go back to last year. Last year's not really attractive if you have more than 100 employees. If you have less than 100 employees, you, there might be something you can do with the employee retention tax credit last year. But if you have more than 100 employees, um, very little uh, benefit that you can get unless you paid people to do absolutely nothing. And if you did, or you put people on furlough and continue to pay, pay their health benefits, in those cases, um, you could get a benefit for last year. The bigger benefit is for this year, 2021. If you have a 20% decline in revenue um, between the first quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2019, um, or the second quarter of 2021 and the second quarter of 2019, um, you could be eligible for the employee retention credit. Uh, again, the threshold here is unlike the PPP, which the, has a threshold of 300, here the threshold is 500 employees. And you could qualify for up to 70% of qualified wages and health benefits paid to uh, each employee up to 7,000 per employee per quarter. So, you know, this really was expanded. Um, it's much better than it was uh, last year. Um, and again, it really comes down to if an organization uh, has a 20% decline in revenue or more. Um, just so that people have access to it, we did issue certain um, guides that uh, talk about all of the tax credits um, through the employee retention tax credit and the PPP changes and everything else and some of the impacts on the nonprofit sector. Um, you can click on these and you can get copies of them. They're on our website. So feel free to grab them, read them and uh, make yourself familiar with them. There's a lot of good information there that, uh, and if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about some of the trends. Well, obviously some of the biggest trends we're seeing in some of the areas that nonprofits um, have been grappling with is in the area of fundraising and communication. Um, you know, the pandemic has definitely put a damper on the ability for a lot of nonprofit organizations to do those uh, in-person fundraising. Uh, a lot of the galas and the golf outings and everything else have had to be um, either canceled or there's been a pivot to uh, move uh, events to um, online. So it's been uh, much more uh, difficult and it's been harder for organizations to bring in much needed discretionary funding. So what do new organizations need to do and what sort of trends are we anticipating happening in the nonprofit sector for 2021? Um, I think the first thing is uh, donors are really interested in understanding how nonprofit organizations have pivoted during the pandemic. How did you remain relevant? You know, so when we look at nonprofit organizations and we look at your organization, how did you remain relevant? Uh, how did you meet the changing needs of your consumers? So you know, as things change and you're now, um, you know, need to focus on things differently. What is it that you're doing? How are you doing things differently? Um, how are you um, staying important? Um, how have your operations improved and become meaningful during the pandemic? So I think donors are very, very uh, interested in understanding that. Uh, you have to realize that donors have a shorter and shorter attention span. Um, when we look at you know, uh, the uh, different levels of donor, different um, age groups of donors, 
Uh, it seems like the uh, millennials and uh, Generation Z, which are the, the two uh, younger um, generations, uh, clearly, you know, uh, these are generations that grew up with the internet. These are generations that grew up with uh, computers and stuff. Um, it's, it's instant gratification. It's um, show me uh, impact succinctly. They want to see um, things like through infographics or pictures or videos. Uh, it's a much more quicker and succinct way of, of reaching out to people. So again, looking at the populations that you're going after, you got to kind of figure out how you're going to be able to, to go after um, those types of populations. Actually, one of the things I wanted to mention, going back to that first thing, um, how did uh, organizations pivot? Did want to tell a little story. I mean, one of the um, applicants for the uh, Imagine Awards this year was a, a small organization out on the East End called uh, East End Food Institute. And uh, one of the things that this organization did was, um, you know, they were looking at the fact that there was a lot of food insecurity out on the east end of the island. A lot of the um, food pantries uh, had a breakdown in their supply chain as restaurants and stuff closed. So they didn't have access to uh, a lot of the food that they normally had. In addition, you had a lot of the uh, farmers, inventors, and um, uh, what do you call it, um, fishermen who were bringing in product or, or um, growing food and didn't have an avenue to sell to because the restaurants were closed. So what East End Food Institute did was they um, hired some staff from closed restaurants. They opened up a kitchen. They cooked a bunch of food that was uh, they were able to get from the uh, local suppliers. And they uh, provided the food to the food pantries and stuff to not uh, impact the food pantries in terms of having them uh, cook the foods and stuff but making sure that they had the foods and stuff that were needed. So again, looking at a, a creative way to um, pivot and utilize resources during the, the pandemic. So that was kind of cool. Um, personalize your message. You know, um, one size does not fit all. I mean, we're, we have seen that uh, organizations that are able to um, personalize their message and deliver targeted messages uh, wind up with a much better response rate in terms of um, fundraising. The, uh, the statistic is about a 40% better um, donation level uh, if you are targeting your donations than when you don't. So as part of that also, you want to try to maximize your donor experience. What is your donor um, feeling uh, from all of this? You know, is it a positive experience? Is it not a positive experience? What differentiates your organization from everybody else? Everybody's out there, um, a lot of organizations out there trying to raise money. Why should somebody give to you and, and not to uh, another organization? Um, I, I'll give you uh, kind of a little uh, story here. Um, this past uh, December for the holidays, uh, we, we gave out, um, 10 checks to uh, smaller nonprofit organizations. And uh, we mailed those out uh, around uh, or um, put it on the, the uh, paid through, through the website of nonprofits. Uh, we did that around the uh, 14th or 15th of December. Of those um, 10 donations, I got three personal messages from uh, executive directors of the organizations that we contributed to. I got six generic letters basically thanking me for my donation. And here we are now um, midway through the month of January and there's been no other communication with any of the organizations. Uh, and I'm not saying that I want every organization to pamper me. The checks weren't that big. They range between $250 and $500. Um, but again, you know, there needs to be that um, ongoing communication, there needs to be some level of engagement um, that makes me feel like uh, my contribution was important, lets me know how my money was being used. And I think you're seeing more now um, where donors are um, doing seed donations and, and really trying to understand um, if the organization kind of aligns with their thought process and whether there's that um, engagement that exists uh, with nonprofit organizations. So I, again, I think that's something that's extremely important on a go forward basis. You need to keep that open engagement with the uh, um, donors that are providing money to you. You know, um, make it personal, less transactional. Um, consider doing backstage tours or 
inviting people into your organization. And it doesn't have to be in person. It could be uh, electronic or, you know, where it's a video or something. But I think you want to kind of create some level of um, fun and interest and engagement with your donors. Uh, you also want to look for better linkage of donations to impact. You know, the, the old thing of $25 feeds a family for a week, $500 provides family shelter for a month. People want to see how their money's being used. People want to be able to equate the money that they're giving you to some sort of positive outcome. Um, one of the other things we're seeing is uh, increased use of um, artificial intelligence uh, powered personalization. So basically there's uh, AI that can be utilized to go through your CMR, uh, CRM systems and uh, go through and make sure that uh, you can really get a better understanding of why people have given to you, what campaigns have been successful, what's worked, so that you can better targeting uh, target your um, appeals to your donors. Sorry, next up. Um, I think it's important also to uh, know your target market. Um, when you look at social media, um, there are different social media marketplaces that uh, kind of work with different age groups. And you can see, you know, your 18 to 29 year olds, 90% of 18 to 29 year olds are online and using social media on a regular basis. 82% from age 30 to 49 are using it, 69% from 50 to 64, and about 40% over 65. So when you think about the uh, different types of social media that are out there, um, you want to target the um, populations that you're trying to serve and, and each type of social media is going to target things differently. So you have TikTok, which is you know, one of the, the newer um, types of social media that's out there. It was actually the number one downloaded social media platform during 2020. And actually they've come out with a new uh, TikTok for Good, which is a community-focused, nonprofit-focused component of TikTok. Um, TikTok is is going to be more towards your 18 to 29-year-old population. Facebook continues to be the most widely used platform. <clears throat> Facebook fundraiser is still a very, very strong resource that the nonprofit sector uh, can utilize. Um, you know, Facebook is. Uh, when you look at 18 to 49 year olds, which is your, you know, your first two categories, 79% of all 18 to 49 year olds uh, use Facebook. Uh, Instagram, uh, Instagram is more for the younger population, the 13 to 17 year olds, about 72% of them use Instagram. 18 to 29 year olds, about 67% of them use Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn is, is more of the, um, for the business community. Um, you're seeing more of that as a business community. And the biggest population there is your 30 to 49 year olds. It's about 37% of them. One thing though is uh, only about 9% of people who use LinkedIn uh, go on LinkedIn more than one time a day. So it's not something that people are regularly going on like some of the other platforms that are out there. You also have things like Twitter, Twitch. Uh, Twitch is for uh, gaming. Snapchat is more geared towards the younger generation. Um, YouTube is a big one. I don't have YouTube here, but YouTube is something that's been um, definitely um, gaining momentum. Uh, YouTube, uh, 13 to 17 year olds, 85% of them uh, utilize YouTube. Uh, 18 to 28 year olds, it's 91%. 30 to 49 year olds, it's 87%. And 50 to 64 year olds, it's 70%. So a lot of people are using YouTube, which again, goes back to the whole thing that videos are um, becoming extremely more important in terms of um, marketing and uh, how nonprofits can reach out to the sector. Uh, we have another question that I'd like to throw up. So which social media platforms are you currently actively using? So you see the biggest one that the nonprofit sector is using is uh, Facebook. 89% of you are using Facebook. 64% are using uh, Instagram, a few of you are trying out uh, TikTok and Snapchat. No one's really using Twitch. Again, Twitch is more for uh, gaming. Um, Twitch is, is actually owned by uh, Amazon. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have the gaming population, that's, uh, it's definitely a good resource. 63% um, are using LinkedIn and 
Twitter about 44%. Uh, Twitter though has, has lost a little bit of steam uh, over the years. So, I mean, again, I don't know that everybody has enough energy and time to be able to um, focus on every single uh, type of social media on a regular basis. So I think you need to pick and choose. And I think, you know, part of this that I wanted to kind of stress is the fact that, you know, it's important to understand um, who you're trying to go after, um, what platforms those populations are, are viewing on a regular basis, and then how can you effectively um, reach them through the different social media platforms? As I mentioned, um, videos are extremely important. Uh, videos will make up more than 82% of all online traffic next year, according to uh, Cisco. Um, so I don't know how many of you are already uh, utilizing um, videos in your reach out to the nonprofit sector. Um, can we throw up the next question? So what percentage of people who watch a nonprofit video do you think make a donation? So if you had to pick, um, what percentage do you think of nonprofit organization, um, what percentage of people who watch a nonprofit video actually contribute after they watch the video? Uh, most people thought it was 20 to 30 percent. Um, the correct answer is 57 percent. So 57 percent of all people who watch a video, nonprofit video, are actually uh, going to make a donation afterwards. <clears throat> Uh, so again, I think videos are extremely important. Uh, videos are extremely powerful. I think if we can add a uh, request for a donation after a video, um, and when we look at you know videos, I mean, things like sharing snippets of your story, show programs in action, um, let organizations um, in behind the scenes and let them see what you're doing. Let them meet some of the staff and the people that you serve. Um, let them see some of the difficulties and tender moments that exists within your organization. I mean, I think some of that stuff is extremely important and powerful. You know, tap into some of the celebrities and influencers out there. Uh, consider, you know, live streaming campaigns. You know, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can do as, you know, an organization to kind of pull people in through video. One of the things that we've thrown in here is we, we um, if you look at this uh, blue box here, the click to read, um, this is a, I thought, a pretty decent article on the ultimate nonprofit video marketing strategy. So um, we kind of gave you a little uh, post here that you can kind of go back and read to see if you can use uh, and get a little more insight into how to do uh, videos. We're not talking about something that's going to require a lot of uh, high-end equipment. You can do a lot of it just using your phone, um, but it's just really a matter of, you know, getting out there and getting people the uh, better understanding of what you're doing as an organization using videos. Because again, videos are a lot more powerful. <clears throat> Some of the other trends we're seeing from a fundraising communication perspective is increased levels of social entrepreneurism. Uh, I think businesses are becoming much more socially responsible. Uh, consumers are demanding it. Um, we're seeing you know, uh, consumers, people wanna know um, that businesses are socially conscious. And if businesses aren't socially conscious and businesses aren't giving back, um, you know, the uh, consumers are going to be less likely to buy from them. So I think it's really consumers that are, are kind of pushing the charge in terms of uh, business social responsibility. And, uh, you know, you've seen these global social justice movements. So consumers are looking for businesses to take a stand. I think that's a good thing for the nonprofit sector because it means then that there are businesses that are gonna be much more receptive. And I think nonprofits need to find ways to uh, open up lines of communication and effectively partner with uh, businesses. Um, and you know, those organizations that can find ways to effectively partner with businesses are gonna, uh, are gonna do well in 2021. Um, I think also what you're finding on the nonprofit side is nonprofits are um, incorporating much more by way of business concepts to become more scalable and sustainable uh, as an organization. And I think that's important. You know, um, I think uh, nonprofits are looking to try to monetize some of the business relationships that they have. Uh, I think they're uh, looking to try to create where possible um, business ventures or other ways that they can make money as opposed to just um, fundraising and, and donations. 
Um, as I said, you want to find ways to creatively partner with your business donors. Uh, the expectation is, and um, donations from businesses have always been one of the smaller areas of contributions uh, for the nonprofit sector. But corporate, corporate giving is predicted to increase by 1.4% in 2021 because of that whole need for increased social responsibility. So we are seeing an uptick in corporate giving that's happening because, you know, again, businesses need to in order to stay uh, viable. Um, virtual events, as I said, are here to stay. Um, you have the, the ability to hold multiple uh, or get, have multiple touches throughout the year instead of one gala. 56% um, of all virtual event organizers uh, claim that uh, they actually met their goal uh, during uh, the year. And uh, again, I think you need to try to find events that uh, engage attendees. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, but you know, you gotta find some way to, to kind of keep um, some level of open communication and some level of engagement with the, uh, the attendees of your events. Um, one of the things that uh, we were involved with this, uh, this past year was uh, uh, the Book Fairies uh, last year uh, did a, uh, a readathon. And what that readathon was, was they, uh, for the, uh, the month of July, um, they uh, raised um, awareness of reading and the need for reading. They brought in um, authors, local authors and, and uh, national authors. They brought in some local talent to read books to uh, kids and families throughout the, uh, the month. And they were able to raise $60,000 or more than $60,000 from the event, um, which for Book Fairies was a, a fairly large uh, event. And they were also able to um, increase the amount of people who visited their website, who um, utilized their, or uh, viewed them through social media and everything. They had a lot more uh, followers and everything else. So it was a very, very successful event and it's something they're gonna continue to do on a go forward basis. So again, you know, I think you just need to continue to look for ways to, to be uh, creative in, in those virtual events. <clears throat> also look to find ways to engage your volunteers. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest issues the nonprofit sector has had um, this past year in 2020 is um, they really weren't able to find ways to effectively engage volunteers. So you've got all these volunteers and they weren't really utilizing the volunteers uh, to their maximum potential. Um, so try to find ways to get your volunteers more involved with um, your organization. Um, when you look at the Gen Zs and millennials who are very, very strong with uh, computers and stuff, Try to bring them in, let them you know, do some of your social media for you, help with videos, graphic designing, maybe develop some apps that might be uh, interesting or you can try to ma um, monetize uh, some of the apps and stuff. But kind of take a look to see how you can uh, effectively utilize um, volunteers out there now, um, because again, they're not, they're not being effectively utilized up, uh, th as of 2020. <clears throat> Some of the uh, things that we've seen, um, there was a survey that was done, and this was of membership organizations, so it's a little different from uh, regular flat-out nonprofits, but um, membership organizations, what they um, did is they ended up uh, having a lot more events than they had traditionally had in the past, and you can see that you know, uh, seven to 10, 11 to 15 and 16 plus virtual events were um, the biggest categories accounting for combined 68% of uh, all of the events. Very few organizations just did one event. Um, and I think that's what you're seeing now is virtual events take a lot less time to do. Um, they don't bring in as much money, but you can, they're cheaper and you can kind of get them off the ground a lot faster. Um, the largest increase that we saw in you know, these types of events were webinars and educational events, and the largest decrease from in-person was the galas and stuff. Because um, again, I think a lot of organizations were struggling with how to uh, do a virtual gala where it became interactive and fun as opposed to just uh, flat. A couple other quick things from a fundraising perspective. Um, there seems to be no offline or online anymore. Um, so you just need to make sure that you keep your messaging consistent across all platforms. 
Uh, I think, as I said earlier, I think you're seeing an uptick in virtual and augmented realities. Um, so, you know, again, if there's ways that you can kind of utilize um, virtual tours, let's say of cultural organizations and things like that, where, you know, you can um, kind of utilize some of the newer technology out there, that, that would be cool. Um, E-commerce is growing exponentially. We're seeing uh, many nonprofits have started to create online stores to sell organizational branded products or donated goods. Um, you know, it used to be that you had an online auction at your fundraising event. You can now set up online auctions throughout the year and, and sell throughout the year as opposed to waiting for an event to occur. So kind of different ways of thinking about things. Donors and volunteers like to know how their efforts made a lasting difference and how their contributions are being used. So again, I think there needs to be um, a little bit more in terms of um, providing information and transparency to donors and volunteers. Um, monthly donations are still on the rise. Something that we're still seeing uh, growth in is the whole aspect of monthly donations. Um, and again, we did give you a little um, click to view, uh, good article on nine ways to promote and encourage monthly giving on your website. Uh, one of the other things I mentioned it earlier, it's not here, but uh, the stock market has done very, very well. Um, last year, uh, well, 19 was, was strong, 20 was even stronger, it hit new heights in 20. And so far this month, the market has done very, very well. Um, not sure how many of you have brokerage accounts established, but if you can get or solicit contributions of stock as opposed to cash, the benefit to your donor is if a donor gives appreciated stock, they get a tax deduction for the full value of the appreciated stock uh, and they don't have to pick up the capital gain. So if you've got someone who you know, purchases a stock for um, $5,000 and that stock is now worth $30,000, um, they could donate that $30,000 worth of stock to you. They get a $30,000 tax write-off and they don't have to pick up the $25,000 gain between what they paid for it and, and what it's worth now. So um, something that organizations um, should think about, um, they should think about uh, the possibility of, of looking at um, donations of stocks um, uh, in, in terms of that. Uh, I know there were a couple questions. Somebody had asked about the, the slides and whether these slides are available. They are uh, in the chat is a, a link to the slides. And somebody asked, else asked about forgiveness of um, the uh, uh, PPP2. And yes, there is a forgiveness, just like uh, the first round of PPP funds were forgivable. Uh, so is the second round. A lot of the rules are the same. All right, we're gonna move on. From fundraising, we're going to look at some of the trends in operations. So, you know, one of the things that we've been telling our um, our nonprofit clients is uh, for 2021, you know, use this as a year to regroup, uh, refocus your mission, um, and communicate your intentions to stakeholders. I mean, one of the things that um, we've been seeing out there is over the years, organizations went through a certain level of of mission creep, where you know they expanded their mission beyond what they really um, were designed to do. And I think you know now is a good time to go back and, and really start looking at you know what is your mission? you know does your mission uh, continue to um, discuss what you do as an organization? Have you grown outside your mission? Should you have grown outside your mission? Um, and kind of look at all of those uh, factors to see um, you know what you should be doing as an organization. Um, I think organizations need to be uh, proactive and not reactive. <clears throat> you know, I, I think the natural tendency is to, um, you know, as, you know, cutbacks occur to, to, you know, react to those cutbacks and try to grab dollars wherever they are. But I, I think, you know, organizations need to really think about what direction they want to move in as an organization and, and focus their growth and focus their plan on that. Now's a good time to be doing strategic planning as an organization. I don't know when the last time some of you have done strategic planning, but if it hasn't been in a while, you should uh, definitely consider that so that you can create your new normal. Um, many nonprofits will be looking to find ways to streamline operations. I mean, again, with government cutbacks continuing, um, some drops in fundraising dollars, you know, you gotta continuously look for ways to do business smarter. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, you got to consider your new realities. Uh, do you really need the same level of um, physical space that you did in the past, or would it be better for your organization to invest more money in technology and be able to do things uh, more virtually, but have better systems, controls, <clears throat> better information, better integration? Should you be um, hiring or utilizing back office staff for things like um, HR, accounting, uh, CRM, or is that something you might want to think about potentially outsourcing either to another nonprofit partner or to a for-profit business? Um, you know, with the um, moving to a virtual environment, one thing that I think it's definitely taught us is that, you know, we're not uh, tethered anymore to um, a geographic area where maybe our corporate headquarters are. I think we've seen that people can work effectively remotely, um, which then opens up a lot more avenues for um, nonprofits to bring on resources that aren't necessarily near their offices. And you can bring on expertise anywhere. So you don't have to necessarily think about hiring locally anymore. Um, you can really look at what are the best resources that I need for my organization and how do I you know, bring on appropriate staff members that uh, could be anywhere now uh, and not just here in, um, you know, on Long Island or in New York State. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think we're going to see increased collaboration in the sector. Um, you know, we've been talking about it for a while, but, you know, shared services, joint programming and, and even some level of consolidation and merger. Uh, I think it, there's a, a lot of nonprofit organizations out there. There's a lot of uh, duplicative effort in terms of nonprofit organizations. And I think if you can find ways where, you know, organizations can come together, um, they can talk, they can share ideas. I think you're ultimately going to get to a point where, um, you know, you'll be in a, a better place for the sector where there's, you know, increased collaboration and sharing and, and, and even mergers. And, and that's not a bad thing, um, having organizations merge. I'd rather see organizations merge and you know, come together and, and be able to continue to provide services than organizations um, not be able to make it and close. <clears throat> From a technology perspective, um, 5G is going to make communication so much more uh, easy than it ever did before, which means that smartphones are going to be the primary source of people coming into the internet and viewing um, nonprofit organizations um, than ever before. There's 271 million smartphone users expected in the U.S. by 2022. You know, so you're really seeing many, many more uses of iPads, smartphones, you know, tablets than ever before. Um, which means that from a mobile fundraiser, text to donate type stuff, that's something that you have to make sure that uh, your website is viewable on mobile devices. You want to make sure that you know um, that you know you're utilizing uh, mobile devices to incorporate mobile devices into your fundraising efforts. Um, mobile video content uh, in, has been increasing by 100% per year, so you want to make sure that if you're doing mobile um, video content, that yours is seamless and it's easy for people to see. Um, there's been new volunteer management systems that have been created for uh, mobile phones so that you can track your volunteers, communicate with your volunteers, um, set up seamless systems with your volunteers. So those are things that nonprofits should look into. Uh, SMS marketing is, is on the rise. SMS marketing is using mobile phones um, or marketing through the mobile phones. So it's pushing information out to your contacts, um, things like um, texts or videos, keeping uh, your network in tune with uh, important information. So if, if you've got expertise within a particular field, if things are happening uh, around where your expertise is, you should be regularly communicating with uh, your donors, with your constituents, with your contacts, um, so that people look at you as an expert and you know, they rely upon you to provide them with information. And you wanna keep people engaged and coming back. You know, that's the important part. We're seeing an increase in technology spending by the nonprofit sector. 2020, uh, there was more money spent on technology in 2020 than any other year. 
in the nonprofit sector. And we're expecting to see that continue in 2021 as the uh, that gap gets closed in terms of nonprofits being behind the times in from a technology perspective. Um, and when we talk about technology spending, we're seeing it in back office systems uh, to allow more uh, remote services to occur. We're seeing enhanced and innovative service delivery, uh, utilizing uh, new types of technology. We've seen some really cool stuff with augmented reality and, um, and stuff. So that's really cool that's happening out there. <clears throat> We're seeing um, a use of technology for staff training and ensuring uh, staff competencies are in place. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind though, as we do see an increase in technology and we start seeing more and more people you know, working remotely and, and tapping into their own um, personal computer systems and you know, using their own um, hardware to, to tap into uh, your network, it opens up a lot more cybersecurity concerns. So one of the things you do wanna make sure is you wanna make sure that if, if um, you are utilizing um, uh, individuals or your employees uh, equipment, that that equipment is properly being serviced by your IT uh, consultant or your IT solution so that um, you don't open up uh, any holes within the system. Oops, sorry. What just happened there? So that you don't open up any holes in the um, the system due to cybersecurity, and then we're seeing an enhanced reliance on cloud-based solutions. So uh, more and more um, software applications are moving away from desktop solutions and moving more and more towards cloud-based solutions, um, which means that uh, organizations are getting um, updates on a more regular basis, better technology and better support than they have in the past. <clears throat> Some of the um, significant challenges we're seeing from a staffing perspective, and this was a, um, a survey that was done by PNP Staffing. Um, so they saw that uh, the biggest areas of challenge were the inability to hold in-person programs, events and conferences. Um, you know, it comes down to how do you keep people engaged? You know, if, if you can't um, be in person, you know, the big challenge is how do you keep engagement? How do you effectively manage remote workers and um, workforce? You know, and that, again, also has to do with engagement and firm culture. And, you know, your nonprofit has a certain culture attached to it. And how do you keep that in culture intact when people aren't coming together? How do you share ideas effectively? Um, you know, I find that uh, organizations are, are spending so much more time um, meeting to just try to stay on top of what's happening from a regulatory basis that, you know, uh, some of the th stuff that's been suffering has been that um, kind of that whole uh, culture that's been established over the years. Um, sustainability of financial support is one of the big issues that nonprofits are grappling with in terms of, you know, um, bringing in those much needed discretionary dollars, uh, especially with cutbacks in government funding. Uh, how do you communicate effectively with constituents, volunteers, and donors? And as I said before, the volunteers, um, it's been very, very tough for the sector to, to kind of stay on top of uh, their volunteers. How do we achieve greater diversity in staff and leadership? Um, that's one of the big challenges. And uh, it's been on the top of many nonprofit organizations lists of things to do for 2021 is to, uh, you know, try to make sure that their board of directors and their management team um, are reflective of the uh, services and the constituents that they serve. Um, so they're looking for increased diversity and then uh, continue need to advocate to funders and policymakers. Um, you're, you're in a situation where, you know, the old, um, the old uh, need to make sure that you're going and meeting with politicians and making sure that policymakers understand how important it is to continue to fund the nonprofit sector and understand how important it is uh, to continue to uh, support uh, what's happening in the sector. Because again, as government pulls back and as government does stuff, you know, the, the sector becomes much more vital uh, and much more needed. And, and right now, more than ever before with the pandemic, uh, the sector is is being tapped, and um, you know, 
uh, policymakers need to understand uh, all of the good things that the the sector is doing, and I don't know that they fully understand because if they did, they wouldn't be cutting back the way they are. Um, I know we have some questions. I'm going to try to uh, uh, to jump in here. Uh, is the webinar eligible for CPE? Uh, it it will not be. Uh, we apologize. Um, we there are some new regulations regarding. Um, webinars and CPE. So we're working on trying to work those out. Um, in terms of seamless with respect to video content, um, seamless meaning that a lot of times what happens if, if you don't have things set up the right way, uh, people won't be able to see the video, it'll buffer. <clears throat> people have a very um, small attention span. And if the video doesn't load up right away, <clears throat> if it takes too long for a video to, to load up, they're not going to watch it. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, that it's a seamless process. They click on it, the video loads, they're able to watch the video. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, that, you know, when I, and I'm going to go back to videos a second, one of the things that I think would be kind of a cool idea for some nonprofit organizations, I mean, you have all of these reality TV shows that are out there. Um, and it might be interesting to, you know, not necessarily do a reality TV show for your nonprofit organization, but, you know, again, really uh, show a little bit more about what's happening behind the scenes in terms of some of these nonprofit organizations, you know, um, what's happening and, and maybe follow the life of um, one of your constituents. Maybe, you know, if someone's going through a, a, a tough surgery or going through something and, and this organization's helping or the organization's helping to build a ramp for somebody you know, go through and tell the story, you know, what's the issue that the person's having? How did the organization step in? What did that mean to the individual? I think all of those things are, are very helpful if done um, in a, a, a great quick way. Um, in terms of outlook regarding support from foundations, again, I think with the stock market up, I think foundations have um, more resources. And I think what you'll be able to see is that um, you should see hopefully an uptick in the uh, donations um, from foundations because again, I think there's more resources available there. Um, okay, that's it for the questions I had there. I'm gonna to try to go into the chat and see if there's anything in the chat that... Uh, uh, looking to see what else we got here. Um, Again, one thing I do want to um, bring up, uh, someone's reminding me within the chat. Um, I want to thank the Nonprofit Resource Hub, um, who was a strategic partner in terms of helping us to put together this um, survey and also in terms of um, supporting the, uh, this event today. So I do want to thank um, all my friends at the Nonprofit Resource Hub for, for kind of helping. And again, for those of you who don't know about the Nonprofit Resource Hub, um, we do recommend you go to the website. It's a, um, a network of um, businesses that work heavily within the nonprofit sector who push information out to the nonprofit sector. Their goal is really to provide education and ongoing information to the nonprofit sector so that the nonprofit sector um, can, can benefit. Um, somebody asked, I'm hearing that the SBA approvals may take longer this round. Do you have any info on that? I don't, Eileen. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take. Some of the applications have just started going in. So we should know within the next two weeks or so uh, in terms of whether that, um, uh, whether it's going to take longer or whether it's going to be uh, consistent. Um, we will be sending out a recording of this if anybody um, wants to um, review this or pass it on to other people. So um, I think we're up by way of time. Uh, again, wish we could be sharing this time in person as opposed to uh, doing it this way. But I do thank everyone for participating. And uh, until next time, take care, everyone.